Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and uh, I thought I'd go ahead and do another one of these in podcast ASMR style while you guys watch me deadlift, because it's like uh, pleasure in your ears with my soothing, sexy voice. So, let's talk a little bit today about isolation movements and how they do contribute to overtraining. Now, this video may come across as a little bit anti-isolation, and in a way it is, but what we need to keep in mind is that every single lift that we do is just another tool in the toolbox. They're like a screwdriver or a hammer or anything else, and there's a right tool for every job, and there's pros and cons of, of every single tool in the toolbox. And we just have to keep that in perspective. I don't think, for the most part, there are that many exercises that I would actually classify as truly bad exercises. Just, you know, some are better than others for different jobs. And I think we can all agree with that. Uh, I think anyone who, who's willing to be objective can agree to that. Now, when it comes to isolation movements, what we oftentimes point out is that they're a good way to induce extra localized fatigue. Because we know that the primary driver of hypertrophy seems to be training volume. It's not exclusive. You always get bigger if you get stronger. Uh, you can grow off of doing one rep maxes all the time. Not ideal. It's not optimal. But you can grow, and you can grow continuously that way. You're not going to grow as fast as possible. And again, kind of comes back to the point of different tools in the toolbox. Right? If that's all you did, you may not grow at your maximum rate. You might not even grow at half your maximum rate, maybe. So volume is important, and that's generally understood. The, the research suggests it. Observing even bodybuilders and athletes over the years has suggested it. It's pretty sound uh, evidence for it at this point. It's pretty reasonable. Most people agree with that. Volume is a major, if not the biggest, driver of hypertrophy and muscle growth. But what we need to remember is that volume isn't everything, and we do need to keep in mind the performance elements. Um, and again, there's a lot to be said for it being difficult to actually train isolation movements for any extended period of time. So there are always going to be supplemental exercises. Uh, but the general idea here is that you can use them to create extra volume in a muscle, like say your triceps. Your triceps might not be getting enough volume from your bench pressing and overhead pressing. Uh, they might be lagging for you, visually, aesthetically, maybe performance-wise. But you're approaching your maximum recoverable volume on your bench press and your standing press. And if that's the case, and you feel like you have uh, a lagging muscle group, the triceps, it's not unreasonable to say, okay, maybe I need to isolate this muscle, right? And picking the right tool in the toolbox, there's nothing wrong with that. But people take that approach with the idea that the tricep extensions do not contribute to overtraining syndrome, and that they do not contribute to overuse. And that's where the problem comes in, because like with anything else, they absolutely contribute to overuse. Uh, and then I'm going to get to the systematic component in a minute, because we're going to compare them with axial loading exercises, which have their own disproportionate uh, systematic effects. So let's go ahead and talk about the localized effects, because the problem that you run into with a lot of isolation movements is that oftentimes they put more stress on connective tissue, and I don't always mean adaptative stress, but actual negative stress that causes inflammation. They sometimes put more stress on the connective tissue locally than a compound movement does. And that's because of the way the load gets distributed. With a compound movement, uh, the stress can be distributed over several joints. It can take the blunt force of it, so to speak. So things like joints oftentimes, and not always, but oftentimes joints can get undue stress for the amount of work the muscles are getting when it comes to an isolation movement. Uh, so a perfect example would be if you have problems with your knee joints hurting, the very last thing you ever want to do is a leg extension. Same thing, if you're getting elbow pain, uh, tricep extensions are probably not a good idea. Because the amount of stress that they're going to put on joints proportionate to the amount of work muscles get is going to be worse than on a press. 
um, and a leg extension is going to put more stress of a certain type on the knee than you're going to get from doing a deep barbell squat for the exact same amount of quad stimulation. And then this becomes even more true when it comes to connective tissue. Certain types of tricep extensions cause rubbing and friction on the side of the tendons of the triceps down at the elbow that you don't get on those presses. That is going to cause localized wear that may not be adaptative in a positive way. Meaning when you get certain types of pulling and micro tearing in tendons, that causes them to thicken up and get hypertrophy. But when tendons are rubbed on the side because you're putting them through, say, an unnatural movement that's not a normal movement pattern for the human body, and that does happen at certain angles on various tricep isolation movements, that connective tissue is going to get inflamed easier. And if it's inflamed more, if it's inflamed more, it is not going to heal as quickly from the other adaptative stress. And that connective tissue is going to become a limiting factor. So you've got to factor this stuff in. You have to factor in the risk of localized overuse because that's the other thing. You've got the, the risk of overuse injuries, the connective tissue and joint level, and isolation movements contribute to that heavily. I really hope people understand that, that there is literally nothing less taxing down at your elbow or tricep tendons about a tricep press down or a skull crusher of certain types than there is by doing a heavy pinch press. You're not doing yourselves any favors if that's a, an area of concern for you. And then we come to the, the localized overuse. Yes, volume is a primary driver of hypertrophy. But if you are inducing so much volume at the level of a single muscle that it can't recover and perform soon enough on your big exercises, you're going to limit your overall hypertrophy. And that's a perfect example. I mean, we don't need to get into every muscle in the body. Let's stick with this tricep and bench press example. If you're doing so much extra tri tricep isolation work that your triceps aren't recovered enough to bench press again or overhead press again within two or three days with similar performance, uh, you're probably shortchanging your overall progress. Because if each muscle is not being trained at least twice a week with sufficient volume, you are absolutely not stimulating maximum growth as it pertains to either, again, your hypertrophy or your strength gains. Uh, and again, this is why there's so much out there regarding concurrent style trainings and other things is trying to balance these things out. This is why a lot of these protocols are so successful for athletes is that they strike balance in hitting different recovery curves so that you can hit different performance elements at different points. So programs that are uh, undulating periodization, concurrent periodization, uh, programs that run heavy, light, medium days, these things work for a reason. So that you can get sufficient training frequency and sufficient weekly volume. Uh, because those are both key for someone seeking maximum growth. And if you're beating up an area at the local level so much that the larger exercises can't perform frequently enough, nothing is growing. Because you're not really getting more tricep growth because the triceps are still going to be limited on frequency because of the extra volume you did. And you're not going to stimulate new chest growth and strength, new delt chest growth and strength because the triceps have now limited your ability to do all your big exercises, the ones that really give you the most bang for your buck. So you have to factor that in, and that's why you have to factor in your isolation movement with your maximum recoverable volume. Because more is better up into a point, and that point is generally the point where training frequency is negatively impacted by your volume. Now, then you have the systematic aspect of it to think about as well. Uh, you know, people think of only the weight moved and the muscle contractions involved with the muscles they're working when we talk about systematic overtraining and overreaching, but there are other factors involved. That's one reason we point out that oftentimes axial loading exercises, which tend to produce the greatest responses, exercises that load your spine usually produce the most muscle growth and the most strength. They also disproportionately impact what? Recovery because there's a systematic response, there's a nervous system response uh, to it that requires additional recovery. We also know based upon all the data, and anyone who needs to, wants to learn more about this, actually go read Matt Perryman's Squat Everyday book, uh, which I think he wrote that book while working on his doctoral program. 
it's actually a really good read as far as understanding recovery and the different things that impact recovery. And some of the stuff that he points out is things like stimulants negatively impact recovery. In other words, your pre-workout's not doing you any favors if you're trying to train at a high frequency because it's negatively impacting recovery. Being overly psyched up in the gym impacts recovery, lifting the exact same weights more than if you did the same weights calm. It has an additional negative impact on your recovery that's separate from the physical lifting of the weights and the contraction of the muscles. So being psyched up hurts your recovery. Uh, and again, not a big deal until you're trying to maximize training frequency. Well, the same thing with certain things with isolation movements. Isolation movements have their own type of psychological arousal. Because you are trying to isolate a muscle, you're holding everything else tight. There is an additional nervous system response to that. And in many cases, because you are trying to focus so hard on squeezing that one muscle that you're contracting everything else tight in your body to keep it from moving, you're creating an additional stress in the middle of the training that can add to your recovery time. It can, if sufficient, dig into your recovery inroads in a way that's completely separate from the work that you just did and the muscle you're targeting. So that's also something that you need to factor in. Doing a lot of isolation movements can, in that regard, start to negatively impact your recovery due to the additional psychological arousal and bracing of your entire body in a way that impacts recovery but doesn't stimulate any muscle growth because those muscles involved aren't being contracted enough to get an adaptative response, but they are being contracted enough to dig a little bit into your recovery in roots. And if you do enough of it, it can mount up. And so that's something else that people need to think about when they start trying to do large amounts of isolation movements. Uh, yeah, just things to factor in. All right, guys, but that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative, and I will talk to you guys next time.